a lot of the things that attracted me to studying yoga, I was not really embodying Mm. by being in LA, getting in my car, road rage, driving to a kirtan with just (laughs) tension balled up in my whole body, anger, frustration, financial stress, worries, a stressful life. It was filled with yoga. It was Mm. filled with things that are called yoga and Mm. labeled yoga. But it was missing the mark. I'm living in Southeast Asia. I don't have access to all of my teachers Mm -hmm. or these practices, but I'm just living it more. Welcome back to Full-Time Yoga Teacher Podcast. My name is Reka and I am your host. I hope you enjoyed last week's interview I had with Stephanie where she shared about her master's degree in yoga studies, and now she brings yoga to community college. This week, I have a very exciting interview that I want to share with you. The conversation I had is with Allison, and if you live in Long Beach, maybe you have taken her class before she moved away to Southeast Asia. So I cannot wait for you to hear all about her traveling and teaching experience. But before we get started, I do have an announcement to make. If you are listening to this podcast in real time, which is in February of 2024, I am hosting a in-person workshop on February 10th, which is Saturday at Ra Yoga in Long Beach. This workshop is from 1 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, And I will be teaching about menstrual cycle awareness and yoga. So if you're interested in body literacy, learning more about menstrual cycle awareness and hormonal health and how movement and yoga practice can help you to find your own balance, this workshop is for you. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out to me and ask me questions about this workshop. Now, let's get back to today's episode. Allison is a teacher that I met when I was still a brand new teacher at a studio that I worked at. She was already quite experienced, been teaching for many, many years. And I remember asking her a couple questions when I was a newbie teacher about how can you make yoga as a full-time job? How is it possible? She gave me some pointers, but what's so interesting about her journey is that she left United States and moved to Southeast Asia to teach yoga abroad. And every now and then she comes back to Long Beach and share with us her stories and her experiences, her journey of teaching yoga abroad. She now calls Laos her home, although she does come back to say hi to us every year or every couple of years, she is home based in Southeast Asia now. So Alison Gomez is a California native who has enjoyed a lifelong relationship with mindful movement. Originally a ballet dancer, she holds a degree in dance from UC Irvine and had semi-professional career as modern dancer with companies throughout Southern California. Alison has taught classical Pilates to everyone from pre-postnatal clients clients rehabilitating from injury as well as professional dancers and athletes. In 2012, she moved into an ashram to study the eight limbs of yoga and began teaching everything from vinyasa to yin to philosophy. In the last several years, she has made Southeast Asia her home and has taught in Thailand, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and Laos. She is actually one of the yoga teacher for my online yoga studio. She teaches a few times a month from Laos. She teaches Pilates, gentle yoga, therapeutic Pilates. She is full of amazing knowledge and experience. So if you are interested in taking her class, you are always welcome to come join me on my virtual yoga studio. You can get first week free and you can get all that information on my website. So I hope you can take Allison's class through my online studio. My online studio has live Zoom yoga classes about four to five times a week and hundreds of recorded classes on on on-demand library. And you can find Allison's classes on there. So you can practice with her from the recording or you can practice with her live on Zoom. 
I think this interview would be very interesting for anyone who is interested in traveling abroad and teaching yoga, which I am definitely interested in. So this conversation was very, very helpful for me to hear and inspiring as well. Let's get started. Okay, so today I get to interview Allison. And Allison and I met at a yoga studio that we used to work together. And she has an amazing journey that I think everybody will really appreciate hearing and learning so much from her. So thank you, Allison, for being here, taking time to chat with me today. And maybe we can start with when did you start practicing yoga? How did you how did you meet yoga? Thank you for having me on as well. My when did I start practicing yoga? Well, I really have been kind of in the movement world for a long time. I started dancing in a ballet school when I was about 10 years old. I ended up doing my university studies in dance. So it was probably in and around that time between high school and university that I think I took my first yoga class ever and really hated it or or (laughs) did not really find a lot of value in it because Mm. I was at the height of serious Russian ballet training. And Mm. so the kind of angle of yoga philosophy of just being fun and free Mm. and, and gentle and exploratory with movement, I was not interested in that. I was interested Mm. in training as hard and as fast as I could to maximize results. And so Mm. yoga did not land with me at that time. Mm And then I started studying Pilates. That was my first sort of professional training in movement. And I actually was a Bikram Ah, person for a long time. Again, I think that more closely met me where I was at Mm -hmm. coming from like a more strict dance background. And then that transitioned in sort of my mid 20s. I had like some major life stuff Mm -hmm. come up and someone recommended to me Mm -hmm. that I find a yoga that was a little bit more well-rounded and a little bit more supportive. And Mm -hmm. that was when I took my first Mm -hmm. classes at Yoga Works in um, Newport, Costa Mesa, Laguna. Uh And that was the beginning of of that journey for me. That's um, interesting because for me too, Bikram was my first introduction to really getting into yoga. I have tried yoga 24 hour fitness before and I was like this is too boring and I come from more sports and athletic background so for me the yoga I took at 24 hour fitness was this is too easy it's too boring mm-hmm. but then Bikram this is challenging and I love it but slowly transitioned into I also practice and study with yoga works in LA so we kind of have a yeah. little similar path which yeah. is cool you were dancing mm-hmm. professionally and you started also practicing yoga and you were kind of doing both together, practicing both dance and yoga. And when did you feel like you wanted to become a yoga teacher and want to take a yoga teacher training? Well, I think it was so to clarify, I, so I started teaching Pilates in 2007. Mm-hmm. So I got my degree in dance and my comprehensive Pilates cert mm-hmm. at that time. So that was already my sort of full-time work. And I always had that in the back of my head as I should probably get my yoga cert. Like mm-hmm. that would that would be an additional challenge that would fit in well with what I'm already doing. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, but somehow I even had that thought before I really had that strong of a personal practice. Mm-hmm. So at that time, I think it was more of just something else to put on the resume or to Mm. to put in the skill set. Then when I started practicing, it really, it changed my whole life. And yoga helped me through a difficult time like nothing else did. And so that is when I realized like the potency of the work. Mm. And so then I really wanted to become a teacher. Mm. And I already felt I have the skill set to teach movement. So I moved into the to an ashram to really study yoga. And that's when I knew that I wanted to teach. So I went into teacher training. I went into study yoga already with the perspective that I would teach. Mm -hmm. I know some people have it a little bit differently where a lot of people go into teacher training just to explore their personal practice. But I I knew I would teach. Yeah, pretty early on. I want to hear all about this ashram experience. But before that, I want to back up to what was the maybe transition from you being a dancer to a full-time Pilates instructor? What was that transition and journey like? Well, I think um, I was fairly talented as a dancer, but I 
it was pretty obvious to me that that was never going to be a full-time sustainable work, especially in the United States. So I always knew that I would need to supplement dancing with something. I also was having pretty severe back pain at the age of 18, 19, like way too young to be having severe pain. And the Pilates really helped me with that and prolonged my career. So that was a very side-by-side sort of development of two careers simultaneously. And most of the other people I was studying Pilates with were also dancers. So that transition was pretty natural. Mm -hmm. And having more control over my schedule, teaching allowed me to still attend rehearsals and make time for performances and travel and all of that. Okay. So then... You, oh, you went to ashram. So tell me about that. Yeah. Where did you go and um, what made you go to that specific ashram? Well, to be a little bit less vague with a lot of the other stories, mm-hmm. um, when I was 25 years old, my boyfriend at the time passed away in an accident. And that was very a life-changing moment. So when I say like, oh, I was doing Bikram and something changed, that, that was really the catalyst. Mm-hmm. So I'll just go ahead and be very honest about that. I needed to reframe my whole experience of living, really. And I think I had a movement practice that was obviously my entree into other form modalities and forms of study and healing. I was always a mover. I always studied and practiced Buddhism, but that was very separate from my movement mm. sort of work. And then it was like when I found yoga, all of those systems supported each other. They helped me find grounding. They helped me make sense of what was going on around me. They helped me develop an understanding of the world and why things are the way they are. So that's what really attracted me to going deeper into this whole system. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking for teacher training, part of the reason the ashram was obviously, again, that was more personal. Mm -hmm. I needed the healing. I needed the support. I wanted that environment. But because I was already teaching Pilates full time, I knew that a sort of weekend teacher training for yoga was not for me. I I wanted to put Pilates on the back burner and focused only on yoga because there's obviously some similarities. And I really wanted to make sure that I kept my learning experiences very pure, Mm -hmm. at least as a beginner. So for me, I wanted to do the total immersion. So Mm -hmm. this kind of teacher training, it's very short, like 35 days, which Mm -hmm. I don't really recommend in general. I think that's a short time, but I wanted the total immersion experience. Mm -hmm. So the ashram I chose was on the big island of Hawaii. It's mm-hmm. Shambhava Yoga mm-hmm. from the Muktananda lineage. And it was 14 of us in a mm-hmm. cohort living together on a sort of a farm yeah. overlooking the ocean. Yeah. Exactly what I needed, exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. Like a container for healing and exploration. 5 a.m. wake up, uh-huh. meditation, seva, selfless service. Mm-hmm. We would do chores mm-hmm. together, asana practice. Mm-hmm philosophy and then temple every evening so we had a temple on site for kirtan and chanting and and just all you can eat Uh like fresh vegan food it was it was great it was a really good experience wow i had no idea about that story that sounds amazing was it um, do you remember the name of the name of the lead teacher yes uh satyam and radha Uh were my my two teachers are they still teaching in hawaii i think satyam is still there um lovely guy both both Uh you know westerners Uh like americans who had a secular life up until they didn't and then transitioned to living at the ashram and they were just lovely like really living their yoga Uh authentically they met us where we were at Mm -hmm. and they really allowed us to have the space as you know we are householders Mm -hmm. still Mm -hmm. we're Mm -hmm. um you know They used to drive us to the beach every day for 45 minutes of free play. Oh, (laughs) And so, yeah, it was still, it was intense, but it Mm -hmm. had heart Mm -hmm. and space Mm -hmm. and it was perfect for me. That sounds amazing. And how many years ago was that? That was in 2012. So 11 years, 11 years that I've been teaching yoga and 17 years I've been teaching Pilates. Wow. And I think you said the 35 days teacher training intensive is not something you may recommend now, but also my teacher training was also one month intensive. And I feel like nowadays it's just been so many two weeks teacher training and like 10 day teacher training. So I think I'm sure your experience was very in depth. So like the essence of the practice, the essence of yoga was there. So that sounds like an amazing experience. So after you finished your training, Did you come back to LA and started teaching yoga? 
So, yeah, I had a little bit of a hard time coming back. And these are things like that maybe I didn't really know when I went into training. And when I chose the training that I did was that if you're not affiliated with a major yoga school or a chain of yoga studios, it's a little bit different, difficult to get hired as a new teacher when you have a little bit more obscure of a training from a singular school out of state. So I believe when I came back, again, I was still teaching Pilates full time. So I was kind of like in the industry. Yeah. But my yoga classes were quite limited for the first year or two. Mm -hmm. I think it was me renting out the Pilates Mm -hmm. studio space Mm -hmm. and offering a class to my friends and family, things like that for a while. Uh And then I think I started teaching corporate classes. Yeah. Uh Things that I had a little bit more control over Mm -hmm. until I was able to actually get into a studio environment. That's pretty cool because I think nowadays a lot of people want to get into corporate yoga, but have a difficult time getting in. And usually a lot of teachers may start teaching at either studio or gyms first, I feel like. So were you kind of teaching mostly Pilates in the beginning and some yoga? And then did it slowly become like half and half? Did it become more yoga, less Pilates? How did that happen? Yeah, it has definitely gone in a few waves. Mm -hmm. And when I say teaching Pilates, to be Mm -hmm. more specific, so I taught some group classes, Mm -hmm. mostly private lessons on the reformer. Mm -hmm. So if Mm -hmm. you are teaching full time kind of in this world, I I would say, well, for me, that made up the bulk of my sort of employment of my work hours for private lessons. And I say Pilates held the vast majority Uh of my work until the last five years until Mm -hmm. moving away. So how do you think that transition happened? Was it conscious and you were trying to make it that way? You wanted to teach more yoga and less Pilates or did it kind of happen naturally? No, it kind of happened naturally. So when I moved away, now I live in Southeast Asia and Uh we can go back and and Uh retouch on that. Uh, There's just certain places where one Uh has the more dominant popularity than the Mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. I think in Southern California, we've even seen that ebb and flow. But in other parts of the world, it's definitely more, I'd say that yoga is a little bit more popular. Mm -hmm. Yoga is a little bit more portable Uh in terms of like equipment. So that's true. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't really have a setup or there's not a studio available, you can probably get a yoga class going more easily than a Pilates class. Yeah, it's been a little bit different, but I I have to say in general, having both, having the variety having the difference really is part of what makes it sustainable to do this full time because it's hard to just do the same things and that day in and day out definitely i think that's a super wise wise words so i think that's around the time i met you was when the last five years or so before you moved to southeast asia we met at the yoga studio and i actually remember asking you because i was trying to make it as a full-time yoga teacher at the time and i was a new newer teacher I remember, I think I asked you, how do you do it? And I think you told me Pilates is a great, uh, you have a multiple stream of income because you also teach Pilates in Mm -hmm. private and you also do yoga. And um, I remember talking to you on the bench in front of the studio, asking you, maybe I should get a Pilates certification. And you're like, yeah, if you don't do it just because of the money, do it because you want to and you love, you love doing it or you love teaching and you love the practice. I remember you telling me that, which was really cool. Yeah. And I think at the time I was really trying to figure out how to make it as a full-time yoga teacher and trying to ask other teachers around. And that's part of the reason why I decided to create this podcast is Mm -hmm. because I don't think not enough of us are openly talking about what it's like to be a full-time teacher and how possible it is, but sometimes how difficult it can be. Going back to your story, so you have made decision, I remember, that you wanted to leave the United States and Mm -hmm. teach abroad. So what made you want to do that? Well, I think (laughs) given that this is a conversation about being a full-time yoga teacher, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. I think we're both proof that it's possible for those wondering if it's possible or not. It is, but it's difficult. So after teaching for so many years and still living in Southern California and just, just feeling like I was treading water, Mm -hmm. just kind of barely staying afloat financially, Mm -hmm. energetically, Mm -hmm. emotionally, I was just ready for a change Mm -hmm. for sure. And I discovered yoga trade, which I'm I'm sure Mm -hmm. some people are aware of, which Mm -hmm. is where you can seek out Uh, opportunities around the world, beautiful places where Mm -hmm. everyone wants to travel and you work maybe one Mm -hmm. to three hours a day in exchange for accommodation and food, sometimes financial compensation, sometimes not. And I just was very attracted to that idea. So I took 
what was meant to be a three month contract mm-hmm. in Laos in a hotel teaching one 90 minute yoga class per day. And that was like the beginning of the end. Uh-huh. And almost six years later, I've taught in Cambodia, in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, uh-huh. slightly varying arrangements as far as like compensation and teaching. I'd have to say that is aside from being just a rich and rewarding experience. Uh Personally, I learned a lot about teaching about the industry a lot by making this change. Well, I'm sure a lot of people listening are probably like, oh my God, this dream, traveling yoga teacher. And um, I think a lot of people see that and idealizes it. And for me included, I want to do that. But I'm sure, like you said, it's not always easy. There's some difficulty. So maybe can you tell us that you said you took the three month contract allows. How did it lead one job lead to the next and to the next? How did all that happen? Yeah. So I was teaching in the hotel and I'll just veer off topic a little bit Mm -hmm. because this is probably like the turning point Mm -hmm. of my teaching like occurred within this space. Uh And In Southern California, as you know, we have, or maybe some people don't even know or realize, Uh but the yoga culture is so rich here Mm -hmm. and yoga is so popular for good or for bad, but we have so many resources as teachers, as students. I felt like I was studying with amazing people and I was Mm -hmm. learning so much about philosophy and anatomy. And I felt very proud and privileged to have, to be able to teach this way Mm -hmm. and even in even in like just your neighborhood studio, mm-hmm. people are learning philosophy and they mm-hmm. are um, sometimes doing mantra and like mm-hmm. it's just a very elevated practice. Mm-hmm. And I really prided myself mm-hmm. on being able to teach in this what mm-hmm. I thought was like an advanced way. And I took that version of myself to Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And wow, um, I mean, first of all, of my students are English as a second language, Mm -hmm. new ish Mm -hmm. or first time students. Mm -hmm. And so all of this stuff Mm -hmm. that I thought was my entire toolbox was out the window. Mm -hmm. It was not useful. Mm -hmm. It was not helpful. It was not relevant. And I went through a very depressive sort of existential, like Uh if I can't use big philosophical words, if I can't speak in Sanskrit, if I can't teach anatomy, mm-hmm. what what am I even doing? You know, mm. is this even worth anything? Yeah. And yeah. I did not feel like I wanted to teach beginner. Right. And I, and one day something just clicked and it totally changed. Mm-hmm. And I saw that having beginners is like an, just the greatest like thing you can offer your students, mm-hmm. like giving someone a friendly and accessible entry point to mm-hmm. a movement practice or a healing practice. And so it totally changed changed for me. And that's uh, that added immeasurable value for me to my career is being happy teaching that way to these students. And, and I don't get a lot of repeat. So it's travelers, right. That are coming Mm -hmm. through somewhere and stopping at a hotel or a Mm -hmm. retreat center. So you might never have a a single repeat student. Mm -hmm. So it's this embodiment of unattachment, unattached Mm -hmm. to the results of your teaching of your students, of your action. It's very but that's what we're meant to be doing. And it's hard to hold on to that philosophy sometimes when you do see the same people every day and you mm-hmm. get emotionally involved. And so it's it, just a crazy learning curve, mm-hmm. really important. But back to your original question. So mm-hmm. I was teaching in Laos and then I moved onwards to Cambodia mm-hmm. to a retreat center, similar style, um, housing and food in exchange for teaching one class a day. How did you find that next job? Was it on the same website? I think that was on Workaway. Okay. So Yoga Trade is obviously Mm -hmm. already tailored to yoga jobs. But what I found is Mm -hmm. if you get in touch with the right people, Mm -hmm. um, if you can offer yoga, everyone wants it. You can maybe create a job where there wasn't one before. Mm, So yeah, maybe that's like a good... Yeah, great tip. tip. (laughs) Yeah, you Uh really can. Who wouldn't want to add more value to their service, which is what a lot of these places are. And I've observed so many young people in Southeast Asia, specifically where I am used to be known for being Uh kind of a party place. And it's really changing Uh with the kind of people that are traveling, what they're looking for, what kind of experience they want to have. So there's a lot more people showing up for and even investing in Uh like wellness practices while they're traveling. Uh So it's changing from what it used to be more like a party place to more people wanting to have more wellness and holistic and yoga experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, so it's cool to be a part of that too. And still feeling like I'm, I'm in the beginning years of that major Uh shift. So that's part of what's kept me over there. Yeah. And then from there, I, 
honestly, once I joined Yoga Trade and started teaching abroad, it's the other teachers that will often guide you towards your next opportunity. Mm. So especially since you're all sort of around there. Mm -hmm. And so I would just get a call from someone Mm. that I met as a fellow teacher in Laos when they were in Thailand. They offered me a space at a retreat center there. And Mm. so I went to Thailand for a month. That was more of, it was really a yoga retreat center. Uh So that was completely yogic lifestyle, much more intense asana practice, Uh workshop things like that did you enjoy yeah. teaching more because you weren't teaching just a beginner there anymore you were teaching maybe right. more practice well seasoned practitioner yeah. did you enjoy that more or what was the because you said beginner was teaching beginner was challenging in the beginning but you kind of went through a breakthrough that you started to really appreciate that yeah. i was that going back to teaching more i guess quote-unquote advanced yeah. It was great. Like Mm -hmm. I said, I think it's the variety. The variety really is the important part. Yeah, but it was great to see. People were more... It's interesting. They weren't more... I guess, how do we even describe advanced, but they were people that were ready to dedicate Mm. a lot of time. So in that way, it was more focused, Uh but asana wise, people were still more on the beginner into intermediate level. They Mm. just were at a place and a time in their life where they were ready to the choice to study. So that was really cool too, because it's teaching the basics, but to people who are really open to receiving it. So that was probably one of my most, my favorite places to Mm. teach. What is driving you to find a new places every few months during that time of your life versus staying in one spot? And just, I guess I want to teach you for a year or two years. It seems like you were every few months going to a different location. I think part of that was more a Mm -hmm. self-serving. I wanted to travel. I wanted to work travel. But I also, it was very obvious very quickly that I had a lot to learn Mm -hmm. by diversifying the environments in which I was teaching. Mm -hmm. So that became really important to me that I gather as as much skill as I can. And looking back, you know, I know there's so many advanced trainings here, but we have developed a little bit of an sort of echo chamber within our yoga communities that are here. So getting outside of that, I I realized was really valuable. And so after Thailand, where did you go? After Thailand, I went to Sri Lanka and more similar to my first job, living in a very nice hotel, one, two, maybe classes a day. Sri Lanka, I will say, of Uh all the countries in that region that offer these kind of yoga treats, they pay, it pays really well. So if anyone's listening and Uh they think they're at all curious about a yoga job abroad, Sri Lanka will pay like almost a Western wage and provide you accommodation. Yeah, that was kind Um, of like my next question I wanted to ask was I know some place you worked at were only, they were giving you a place to stay, maybe food. Um, maybe a little bit of money for teaching some place or probably only offering place to stay and food. How were you co- able to continue to travel financially? And it, in Sri Lanka, you were able to find a place that actually paid yes. well. Yeah, no, I think that's a good mm. distinction to make, especially mm. for the sake of like where this podcast is going. I think I'm, I'm the anomaly. Mm. I have made it work mm-hmm. somehow, but most people that do what I'm doing over there have some supplementary income Uh or they are like you have developed a Mm -hmm. sort of online presence that is more sustainable. I went away with some savings and have worked in the interim. When I come back to the United States, I'll work and save money. But it's really helpful when you have something else going on. So nowadays, I'd say most of the yoga teachers I meet do some sort of remote work unrelated Mm -hmm. to yoga even. So I think I'm the outlier. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know what anyone's living standards are. You can simply survive on yoga if you have a simple lifestyle Mm -hmm. with less expenses. So um, yeah, it's possible. I don't know. It's possible. It works for me. Yeah, I like that. Um, Because when people ask me, how do you do it as a full time yoga teacher here in LA? Usually what I say is like, I don't think a lot but I live very simply and that's the only way I could do it I wouldn't be able to have two bedroom apartment on my own or you know I don't own a car like I try to keep my expenses so low so that I can do teach yoga yeah so and then I feel like living in Southeast Asia probably your living expenses are quite small if you want it to I'm sure you can live in a very extravagant way as well but you can also live quite simply so you probably don't need to make as much as you do make you have to make in LA Uh it's true yeah. It's true. So how many years have you been since you left LA? To teach? Five and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Five and a half years yeah. in Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. 
all through COVID, almost three years yeah. of a closed border. Yeah. Like I chose to stay there. I want to, okay, let's get to the next part. So you, after Sri Lanka, how long were you there? I was only in Sri Lanka a month. I had a three month contract, but uh-huh. I chose to leave after a month simply because I wanted to go back to Laos. Yeah. That just happens to be uh-huh. where my heart strings were uh-huh. pulling me towards. Um, yeah. Okay. So even, even though Sri Lanka paid well, you're like, mm, I like it here, but... Laos is calling Laos, me back. Laos okay. was calling me, but uh-huh. I do highly recommend Sri Lanka. Yeah. Okay. So you went back and you kind of already knew people there already to find a yeah. job quite right away. Laos was a hidden gem for me. Mm. Laos worked well for me because unlike its neighbors, Thailand mm-hmm. and Vietnam, where you know those countries are more developed, more Western, there's mm-hmm. a fairly strong yoga presence there mm-hmm. within their nationals as well. Mm-hmm. So they do not need a mm-hmm. yoga teacher from the West. I there are it. some for yeah. sure, especially in Thailand, but in Vietnam, there's plenty of Vietnamese yoga mm-hmm. teachers. Mm-hmm. Laos just hasn't gotten there yet. And so my ability to both work mm-hmm. there sort of un- off the grid mm-hmm. without having any problems with the government and also there's a demand for mm-hmm. a Western teacher. That is the difference mm-hmm. between Laos and I think a lot of other neighboring sort of countries. It was easy for me to go back there. I was in demand uh-huh. in multiple different cities. Nice. So it allowed me also to still kind of travel and uh-huh. stay mm-hmm. mobile and free. Yeah. So that's that's also why uh-huh. Laos was so appealing. So you've been back in Laos ever since after Sri Lanka coming back. That's kind of where your Correct. home base has been. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about how the pandemic affected your teaching career Mm. and and your decision to stay in Laos during that time. I was teaching in a city called Lang Pabang Mm. and the yoga there was for tourists. Mm. By design, that's who came. The expat community there were not the kind of people that were interested in yoga really. And Mm. also expat communities often are not as keen to mix with the tourists. Mm. So if something is a very popular tourist activities, the people that live there full time are not Mm -hmm. really (laughs) wanting to be in that space. So when COVID hit, Lao closed their border completely and tourists slowly trickled out Mm -hmm. and or people obviously were finances changed. So the yoga went to nothing very quickly. That was very scary. I still, it's an affordable and a simple and a safe place to live. So I still chose to stay there and I happy with the decision I made. But what I had to sort of do to become resourceful was I started appealing to this small group of expats who became my friends and Uh they're not yoga lifestyle people, Uh or maybe they didn't think they were, they were not the kind of people that, yeah, were interested in yoga, but I yeah. became their friend uh-huh. and I gained their trust. Yeah. And then they started realizing that, you know, we all needed stuff to do. Yeah. We needed healthy things to do mm-hmm. during that time to keep us a little bit more sane. It was, we were very much a community holding each other up at mm-hmm. that point. So mm-hmm. I survived COVID on just maybe three to six people mm-hmm. that were coming to my class, wow. paying three dollars a person Uh it was enough and it was also at that time i hadn't really heard of zoom i i was not interested Mm -hmm. and still barely interested in doing anything online Mm -hmm. i never thought of getting a youtube channel it was just not for me and it took me maybe a year into the pandemic when i started seeing everyone do the zoom stuff i don't know why but i did not think that would be for me and i had a former client a Pilates client reached out to me. She was also living somewhere else mm-hmm. in Europe and I was in Asia and she just inquired about a, a private mm-hmm. mat class. And, you know, I quoted her, which uh-huh. for her was quite a low price uh-huh. for me in Laos was really pretty good. Yeah. And I, I did a private session with her three times a week for the maybe a year and a half, uh-huh. two years. And that really kept me afloat. And I had this sort of fear that uh-huh. when the pandemic ended, people would be running back to the studios. Mm-hmm. They would be so over doing these online mm-hmm. classes. But I found that a lot of people actually grew to enjoy the online option. And so some of these clients ended uh-huh. up staying with me. Yeah. It fits their schedule, their budget. Uh-huh. They're comfortable at home. Not everyone wanted to jump back into open public spaces. So yeah. Yeah, that was also kind of my entree to getting Uh online, which let's be real, it's Mm -hmm. the future. I'm going to have to become more proficient with working online. So that for me, I guess, was the positive Mm -hmm. coming out of COVID. And now, well, you're right now visiting Long Beach, Mm -hmm. but you're getting ready to go back to Laos. 
when you do go back or maybe even right before you came to visit Long Beach, what, what was your schedule like, teaching schedule like more recently? Yeah. So over there, this the kind of schedule I'm able to maintain is pretty light mm-hmm. compared to a schedule here. So probably one class per day that's like open to the public. This mm-hmm. would be the kind of class that travelers mm-hmm. just show up to. It's all drop-in basis. We mm-hmm. never know how many people are going to come and we get paid commission. Mm-hmm. And then I think I'll have maybe four Mm -hmm. hours a week of online, private and group. And then in the community, I'll usually have two or three private classes Mm -hmm. per week as well. Yeah. So what was your schedule like in LA when you're at the busiest? Like how many classes were you teaching a week? And then compared to what's your typical schedule now? Like what's the difference? I think Mm -hmm. my, at my busiest, my schedule here I think was maybe 34 classes a week, wow. which if you're a yoga teacher listening to this, you'll know that that uh-huh. is a lot. Yeah. If you're a non yoga uh-huh. person listening to this and you work a 40 to 60 hour work week, uh-huh. like I understand that sounds light, but it's not. Uh-huh. And I was doing a combination of, I think I had four different corporate uh-huh. clients. So uh-huh. usually those are just once per week, four yeah. different locations uh-huh. as far away as Huntington beach. Even I did probably 20 of those hours were private Pilates equipment, Pilates uh-huh. apparatus sessions, and then maybe three yoga classes per week at the traditional like yoga studio. And then what else? Six I, days a week, mm-hmm. always working Saturdays, mm-hmm. worked a lot of evenings yeah. in Long Beach. It's a little bit more of a working class community. Mm-hmm. So you have to be ready to take clients after work hours mm-hmm. and on the weekend. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of, dri- <laughs> lot of driving and in Laos. Your teachings load has decreased quite a bit, but still that's enough for you to make a living Mm -hmm. in Laos and kind of still live comfortably. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see yourself? I mean, it's okay that you don't know, but do you see yourself living in Southeast Asia or Laos for quite a, quite a while from now, or are you kind of open to moving again or open to traveling to another place? Or do you feel that's your home for now? All of the above. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, of course, I'm incredibly open. Uh, I'm very open. But for now, I, I uh, intend to stay there. I feel like it's a really special mm-hmm. thing that mm-hmm. I found. And as we know, like that's yeah. impermanent as well. So as long as I can make this viable and make it work. Like I mentioned, Laos is a little behind Vietnam, Thailand, Bali, all of mm-hmm. these places where yoga has really exploded. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just scratching the surface over there. So mm-hmm. the fact that I might be able to be part of that is really cool mm-hmm. to me. And there's yeah. a couple of yoga teachers over there that I really have grown to love and respect and yeah. we're kind of at the forefront of yeah. getting to create how we want yoga to be represented in Laos. I think that's cool. So to any of your listeners as well, if, if, if you think you want to teach yoga abroad, instead of being attracted to the places where there's already so much yoga, if you take the path that's mm-hmm. maybe a little bit more difficult, mm-hmm. you can actually forge kind of your own yeah. yoga space in places where it's not as prevalent yet. So true. Yeah. And from your all of your travel experiences, what are some lessons you learned along the way that you wish you knew or if you were going to give advice to somebody who's going to start that journey of trying to be a you know traveling yoga teacher or trying to be an international yoga teacher what are some advice or wisdom you could share with teachers who is interested in doing that well there's a really good opportunity Mm -hmm. to live your yoga like really live all of these philosophies and it's not as comfortable as Mm -hmm. you think like Mm -hmm. for me I had to let go of Mm -hmm. a lot of my practices it's a little bit more difficult to maintain kind of a healthy lifestyle just access to things like the the foods Mm -hmm. that we're used to over here Mm -hmm. and just access to anything I had to let go of a lot of that and Mm -hmm. instead look to value a slower pace of life, which is, I think what I'm trying to say, I guess, is a lot of the things that attracted me to studying yoga, I was not really embodying Mm -hmm. by being in LA, getting in my car, road rage, Mm -hmm. driving to a kirtan (laughs) with just (laughs) tension balled up in my whole body, anger, frustration, financial stress, worries a stressful life. It was filled with yoga. It was Mm. filled with things that are called yoga and Mm. labeled yoga, but it was missing the mark. Mm. I'm living in Southeast Asia. I don't have access to all of my teachers Mm. or these practices, but I'm just living it more. Mm. It's slow. You know, I watch a baby goat like Mm -hmm. walk through (laughs) 
a field and I notice when like a butterfly, you know, and maybe some people are better Mm -hmm. at that Uh than me uh when they're here in this environment. But for me, it's difficult. So instead, I just kind of, I I feel more of a yogi than ever. Mm -hmm. And I think I practice less hours in the studio Mm -hmm. than I did before. So for me, that changed. And but advice for people Mm -hmm. that if they think they want to teach abroad, really have like really have a think Mm -hmm. about what it is that you intend to offer and what you expect to receive. There's a lot of different opportunities. There's there's opportunities to be exploited if you're not careful and you haven't sort of developed your vision and your boundaries. And there's, I mean, there's just so much yoga. There's so many practices out there in general and you can't be everything Mm -hmm. to everybody. So I would say if you're moving abroad or if you want to go into a new space and, and offer Um, your teachings, like really decide which ones resonate with you, which ones you really feel Mm. is in your scope of practice to offer. And, you know, you don't have to do everything. Having a healthy boundary. How is it that, because you do come back to LA once a year or so, or every few years. Yeah. How does it feel to come back? Because, you know, now your home and where you live has such a different culture. Like you said, how you describe how yoga culture is in LA, it's like so true. You know, like people are driving and so stressed out and they try to go into this yoga class and find peace, but then their mind is still so stressed out and frustrated. And so, yeah, I'm curious how it's like for you whenever you come back to LA and then you go back to Laos and like what feels like it'll be a a huge adjustment. Yeah. Uh Um, Specifically after COVID, when Uh I had not been back for three and a half years, I had a very difficult time. Not only is it just slower over there in general, but wow. after a complete and total absence of tourism and closed borders, mm-hmm. it was a very quiet and a very peaceful place to live. Not to romanticize that it was mm-hmm. everyone was really struggling, mm-hmm. but coming back into California after that really just like the noise, the traffic, the speed mm-hmm. at which things move, it was sensory overload. And mm-hmm. that is an understatement. I mean, I really felt my nervous system overloaded. Mm -hmm. And what that sort of told me was Mm -hmm. we have all, whether you like it or not, no matter how many healing practices you think you engage with, we have adapted to that and just accept that as normal. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a huge, that was information that I lived, Mm -hmm. you know, 34 years or whatever with my nervous system functioning that way. And I can't imagine anything less Uh healthy, you know? And again, we're we're trying to mitigate this by being so dedicated to our practice Mm -hmm. and and what we put in our bodies and what kind of energy we surround ourselves with. But I mean, you can't get away from it. You Uh really can't. And that really, I always have a good time when I'm back. I'm always extremely grateful for everything Mm -hmm. I have here and that I come from here. But Mm -hmm. nothing has really sold me on wanting to live this way again much. Oh, that was good for me to hear. I feel like I understand it like logically in my brain. Yeah, living in LA is stressful. But everything you said, it's like, wow. So you feel like for now... Living in LA, it's not not for you. It's not You're for me more, right now. Yeah, you want to yeah. be in a quieter, more peaceful place. Yeah, and you don't have to work like thirty six classes a week there to survive. No, <laughs> yeah. and people told me I was crazy when I left, but I uh-huh. just life doesn't have to be that way. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, I make plenty of sacrifices. You know, there's a lot of things that I don't have that I go without. Live very simply over there, but for me, it's worth it. And in terms of yoga teaching. You can't give in 36 hours a week what you can give in 10 hours. It's just Mm -hmm. not, you know, we're not superhuman. And Mm -hmm. I know we love and appreciate all of our our students and our opportunities, but I can see it. I can feel it when I have one class to teach that day, what I'm able to bring to that class versus when I'm trying to either pace my energy or I've simply just run out of energy and you still have to teach and it's so unfortunate because yoga is so valuable and, but we're only human. And I hate to see the value of yoga deteriorating because us as full-time teachers, those of us who choose to teach full-time, we just simply can't maintain the standard. And that's sad for both us and our students. I agree. Do you have any one last advice? Maybe not particularly for somebody who's trying to be an international yoga teacher or a traveling yoga teacher, but somebody who is wanting or interested in becoming a full-time teacher in general and maybe they're wondering is it possible to make it how is it like what are some wisdoms you can share with 
that person or maybe the mistakes you learned along the way that you wish you knew. Mm. I cringe often when I have like flashbacks of mistakes <laughs> I made when I was like a new teacher. You know, I'm sure we all do. But I think we're, we're rushed. All of us just want to be somewhere that we're not. Like mm. I did not embrace being a new teacher. I wanted to be like an mm. expert teacher, like mm-hmm. so fast. And probably mm. I'm sure you're similar because I know that you love continuing education. Mm. Like you want to gather mm. so much knowledge and you want to share it, like shout it from the yeah. rooftops, like share it with everybody. <laughs> and you can't really do that. So mm. I, I just would encourage people to embrace being a beginner start slowly, mm-hmm. really sit with what, what resonates with you. Mm-hmm. I think the thing that I still do in my practice now, when mm-hmm. I go through periods of feeling less inspired or a little bit stuck, trying to remember what yoga did for me. Again, I can't be every teacher to every student, but yeah. I try to remember what instilled these changes in me, this effect in me, like I can pass that on when I'm having doubts about other parts of the practice or my ability as a teacher, I need to be go, I need to be able to access these sort of points of reference that are Mm -hmm. like what helped me the most in the practice. And I, I see and hear like maybe new teachers starting off and they sound like 30 different teachers in one, Mm -hmm. you know, and Mm -hmm. you just, you have to find your own voice and you have to maintain your own practice. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're talking about teaching full time, that's something that is difficult that Mm -hmm. you have to really commit Mm -hmm. to maintaining like your own practice Mm -hmm. and your teaching because you're not teaching your own practice to other people. That's not your class. Mm -hmm. You've already had your class. Yeah. It's a different, it's, Two different bodies yes. of mm. of the work existing. Those are amazing, amazing advice. I just love what you said about enjoying just like slow down. Like you're not gonna get from this point to advanced teacher right away, but that journey along the way is where we can actually savor and enjoy, you know, rather than rush and try to get to point B actually like slowing down and enjoy oh thank you so much for My your pleasure. time thanks for having me is there anything else that i didn't ask or anything that you want to i don't know you want to say or mention before no i don't think close? so other okay. than i mean if these are like mm-hmm. your your people that follow you regularly they might mm-hmm. see me again mm-hmm. we're gonna start yes probably teaching together more all yes. up here on your virtual yoga studio yes. and tell us where we can find you so you can find me on reika's virtual studio so mm-hmm. i'll be offering a mix of yoga and pilates there like mm-hmm. i mentioned a few times i teach both so mm-hmm. i'll be able to integrate that into some different and unique styles of classes I already have some videos, I believe, up in the library. Yes. So if anyone is interested, some of them, you get a little bit of Lao in there as well, with <laughs> some geckos and chickens and, and the whole environment. So yeah. they can find me there. And if there's anyone that wants to um, reach out to me with any question, um, I'd be happy mm-hmm. to share more of what I've learned and the mis- many mistakes I made. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Ali G, the Yogini, A L L I. G T H E Yogini. <laughs> and I'll I'll put a link to her Instagram Perfect. on the show notes. So that is it. Thank you so much for your time. And I learned so much from your journey that I didn't know before. And I really appreciate our friendship. Me too. This long. So yeah. and I I love seeing your journey of all the places you've been teaching and what I see a little bit on Instagram or what I hear whenever I, you come back and see come back to Long Beach and we get to hang out. So thank you so much and keep, thank keep you, doing Rika. what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> I hope this conversation I had with Allison was interesting to you and maybe spark your interest in possibly traveling and teaching yoga in different countries. I definitely was inspired to do that. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share this podcast with your fellow yoga teacher friends. You can leave me a review on any platform that you're listening to this podcast. And if you want to take Allison's class on my online yoga studio, whether live on Zoom or on demand library, you can find her classes on my website, www.rekayoga.com. And I will I'll leave the link on the show notes. And if you are interested in coming to my upcoming workshop on menstrual cycle and yoga, that is on February 10th, Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m., 
I'll also put a link to that workshop on the show notes. I hope you have a great rest of your day and see you next week. Thank you.